Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read them all, amen. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, and some of your translations say another month, in the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenants of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your ears open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my command, then even if your exile people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delights in revering, revering your name. Give your servant success today and by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Lord, I ask for your word to move forth. I ask for you to decrease me and increase your word. I ask for your word to uh, convict us, Lord, not condemn us and take us to another level in you. Allow even the hearts that are upset, even the hearts that are broken, even the hearts that may be angry in the midst of this place to receive a word from you, even from this broken vessel. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to speak to you from the subject of you have to be broken to lead. Amen. <laughs> Nehemiah, the series, you have to be broken to lead. See, people with needs are all around us, people with desperate needs. Now, think of the great diversity of these needy people around the world and even our very own communities and neighborhoods and churches, the single mothers who are destitute, the children who are physically, mentally, or sexually abused, the poverty-stricken who are hungry, thirsty, or homeless, the unemployed uh, who have lost their jobs and cannot find adequate employment to support their families, the widows, widowers, and divorced who must face a life, a new life on their own. The masses who are lonely and empty and without purpose. The masses who are diseased, injured, or dying. Men and women of compassion must step forward. Men and women who have a genuine deep concern about meeting the needs of others. Nehemiah was such a man. In fact, he was so gripped by what was going on, he opens this entire first chapter to let us see his broken heart, the brokenness of how he's worried about these people. In fact, Nehemiah's name means Jehovah Comforts. That's why we have to be careful of what we name our children, whatever we call them. We're calling those things that be not as though they were. Remember when we talked about uh, don't die in Lodabar, we talk about the meaning of Mephibosheth's name. His name means out of the mouth of sorrow. Come on, somebody. How many people know you have to be careful of what you name and call your kids? See, see, reading this text, I began to see the struggle of Nehemiah. But see, Nehemiah was in the palace. Now, don't get it twisted and think that Nehemiah was a, a, a Mr. Belvedere or think that he was Benson in the beginning of the episodes. No, the cupbearer was a prestigious job. The cupbearer was the right-hand man of the king. The cupbearer was a high executive in the king's court. The cupbearer was a trusted official. So, so he wasn't no ordinary Joe on the side of the road. He was essentially esteemed and he's still worried about the people in the common places. Come on somebody. I, 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 sometimes what we have to understand is the, the story of the Good Samaritan. 
The good Samaritan, uh, the priest passed on the other side because the law said that you can't touch a corpse before you go into the house of the Lord. So in order to obey the law, he didn't sow compassion because he wanted to make sure he got the church. And the other guy, the, the, the Levi, he, 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 the, the other individual, he saw that the man was, was, was on the side of the road and said, you know what? It may be the marauders may be hiding in the woods. I, I can't help him because what will happen to me if I help him? But the good Samaritan had the mind of Jesus. The, he didn't say, what will happen to me if I help him? He said, what will happen to him if I don't help him? That's how the church has to be. We have to get to the point where we don't worry about the comfort of our houses. We don't don't worry about the comforts of our job and we will do whatever God tells us to do. Sometimes when you do what God tells you to do, you may risk your job. You may risk your prestige. You may risk your reputation. But all I'm here to tell you is right now is whatever you sacrifice for God is really not a sacrifice because God will give it to you a hundredfold when you're obedient to him. I was convicted as I read this text because I was getting frustrated. And I began to talk to even some of my brothers and sisters in the church. And like every time I try to work with the other pastors, all they want to do is what's down on the number streets. They don't want to come down to the Denby area. Won't you help me in Denby since I keep coming to help you over there? But God said, Negro, if you don't shut up and be quiet and do what I told you to do. See, see, you got to understand that injustice anywhere is a threat everywhere. And God said, you already have an anointed to serve the community. That's why they serve in their community now. They following your lead. Go over there and help them because if you don't help them, the same mess that goes on over there will creep down to your neighborhood. That's what we have to understand. When one body part of the body hurts we all hurt have you ever had a body part on you hurting so bad that you didn't want to go to work one of your fingers may hurt you can't even go to work because you just so much in pain maybe your eye hurt maybe you have an eye infection maybe your ears hurt maybe you have a headache maybe you have some migraines going on and because that one part of your body hurts you can't do nothing that's how the church needs to feel when one brother is down don't kick him down pick him back up you should feel the pain that he had Nehemiah, you don't understand what Nehemiah was risking. Let's, let's, let's look back in Ezra. Let's look back in Ezra and, and, and look about what happened in Ezra chapter 4. And what we need to understand is Nehemiah, even though it is canonized in the Bible, uh, uh, in, in, uh, kind of uh, uh, in the middle or somewhere closer to the beginning of the Old Testament, it really was written right around the time of Malachi. So even though Esther comes behind Nehemiah, Nehemiah actually was written after that. Amen. If you have a chronological Bible, you will understand what I'm talking about. So Ezra, look what happened with Ezra. Ezra 4, 12 and 13. It says, be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are coming to Jerusalem, building the rebellious and bad city. And have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. Be it known now unto the king that if the city be builded and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll, tribute, and custom? And so shall it endamage the revenue of the king. So look, this king who he's about to go to is the same king that shut down the building of the wall the first time. Oh, come on, somebody. Have you ever wanted to ask your boss for a raise but you were scared to go in there? Now, your boss may can fire you or may write you up, but, but he can't persecute and kill you. Now, this boss would kill him if he didn't like it. And let me just give you the background of this king. This king, his cupbearer or somebody high official, his dad's cupbearer or somebody murdered, murdered uh, his father. And this man went and killed him himself. He ain't called nobody. He went with a, with a dagger and killed him, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then he killed his brother who opposed him. And then he killed the other brother just in case he opposed him later. So this man, Nehemiah, is doing great risk. Somebody had just went to the king a few years ago and said, you need to stop letting these people build a wall. You ain't going to get your money, king. You ain't going to get it. Has anybody ever brought you some, let me tell you something news? You know, let me, let me tell you. But as a matter of fact, have you ever been the victim of some, let me tell you something news? And people begin to try to break down the reputation of the people you know, the people you love, because they just want to tell you something. They went and said, this wall that they're trying to build is rebellious. You ain't going to be able to, to, to take up no money. And isn't it amazing how nobody got mad as long as they were building the temple? But when they began to try to build the walls of the city, people got upset. Do you know the devil don't care about no stained glass windows? 
The devil doesn't care about the customary seat you think that's yours. In fact, he'd rather you keep it because that means the church ain't growing no how. Do you realize that he loves it when you got your same seat all the time because it ain't growing? Do you not know the devil knows he cannot steal your salvation, but he wants to keep you from bringing somebody else out of darkness into the marvelous light? Do you know when you really try to do ministry, bumper building, when you really start moving pews and moving chairs around to do ministry, you know the devil will get agitated and mad and bothered because he does not care about the pews. He does not care about the stained glass windows. He don't care about the same thing you do every day. What he gets mad about is when you do ministry. And when you begin to do ministry, you're going to be attacked. Why? Because you're bringing somebody else to God. He already know you saved. He just wants you to remain so selfish that you don't share the good news with nobody else. Oh, so look, they built up the walls. And Cyrus, Cyrus was a wicked ruler, but he looked like he was good because he let them build up their temple. But you know why he let them build the temple? Uh, you know why he let them build the temple, Brother Dawson? It's because he wanted them all in the same place to collect his money. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, back in the day, Master used to let you worship. Because he let you worship because he didn't, he wanted to be able to count you and make sure you was all accounted for. That's why even though I do the Baptist finger, I hate it. You know what? This came from slavery. This came from when you tipping out to go use the bathroom, you held your finger up to let master know you ain't trying to sneak out. See, nobody cared about the black church. Nobody cared about the African-American church. You could have your praise. You could do your worship. The politicians can come in and tell you what they want and get you to vote for them because they're Democrats, and that's all we vote for. So, so they want to make sure they keep you in that same place so they can have you all gathered together. But the minute Mega Abbott and Martin Luther King began to take the church and start trying to pray about a new heaven and started praying about a new New York, a new Atlanta, a new Hampton Rose and a new Newport News, when you begin to do the ministry of God, they're going to come at you. You know, they say that we have a separation of church and state, but one of my favorite preachers, and I love him preaching, but, but now he done trying to pull all the black preachers together to come together and vote for Donald Trump. Because evangelicals, that truth be told, they say they don't put the faith in the government, but that's where they put it. But now there's somebody else in there. Uh, Yeah, now there's somebody else in there, they showing you the truth. Now they're getting into politics. They didn't care about the separation of church and state until it began to benefit the oppressed. And if you don't raise your finger and get permission from them, they will assassinate you. And the same people that you're trying to serve will shoot at you too. Why? Because Master didn't say you could preach on that. Oh, yeah, I'm coming today. You don't, don't you preach on that, brother pastor. I don't know now. You're going to get us in trouble now. Because everybody's worried about the new heaven. Yeah, heaven already reserved for me. But I want some type of heaven down here right now. I want the blessings God has promised me right here and right now. Jesus came to give me life and to give it to me more abundantly. But the minute you start preaching about that, even your own people to shoot. You know, King was even stabbed by his own people, the same people he was trying to save, the same people he was trying to lead because he was changing stuff too fast. They became uncomfortable. They were like, King, if you just sit in your seat and let the good man take care of us. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. King Cyprus didn't care as long as they weren't trying to build the walls up. He didn't care what they did. Our reserve seeds didn't care as long as you worship and stay in church, you're good. Keep on having your hat committee. Keep on having your biscuit frying contest. Keep on having your conferences that only church folk come to anyhow. Keep on having your prayer meetings where ain't nobody coming but the prayer folk. But when you start going out in the highways of the city, you're going to make the devil upset. Sit down there and eat your biscuit and be a good man. The devil ain't scared of no church that ain't moving. The devil don't care how big the churches get. That's why you don't have to worry about how many people join the church. If the church doing something or not, you can have a five-member church and be setting the city on fire with the kingdom of God, but you can have a 2,000-member church and you ain't saving not one soul. You just keep on having it like a club because everybody that's in there don't want nobody else to come. This ain't your church. This is my club. 
I paid my dues. It's my seat. There ain't no room for no new converts. As long as you're just worried about the people that look like you, the people that worship like you. See, that's why you got to have some old songs and some new songs. You can't just have old songs. You got to bring some new people in. And you can't just have new songs. You can't run the old folk out. You got to have a balance. The problem is the church doesn't pull together. Amos said, how can two walk together unless they agree? But church folk will walk all together and want to do everything they want to do because they want stuff their way. You have got to increase your prayer life and see what God is trying to tell you to do, what he's trying to make you move. See, the problem with this is sometimes people don't think visionaries pray, but we already been prayed. So when, the, when something comes, we already prayed up. Jesus never prayed to do a miracle right before a miracle except for Lazarus. And again, I believe he did that because he really didn't want to bring Lazarus back down here. No how. He knew Lazarus didn't want to leave heaven. He didn't want to leave heaven himself. But Jesus, when he healed somebody, he said this. Why? Because his prayer life was so strong and fortified that when the problem came, God had already had the answer. Come on, somebody. I didn't know what kind of battle I was going to go into, but before I went to Africa, God told me to put a Nehemiah service together. But when I got home one Thursday night, God showed me what he, why he wanted me to do it because he already knew what was going to break out in the house and he wanted me to be prepared already. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. But see, when you just pray in a crisis and you ain't prayed up before the crisis, then you think you got to have a prayer meeting to hear from God. But you should have already been in your prayer closet before the battle broke out. You should never be blindsided if you prayed up with God. Can't nobody blindside you. Can't nobody ambush you. Why? Because God already going to show it to you if you have a prayer life. Nehemiah was a praying man. Y'all better stop messing with folk that pray. Even though Nehemiah was about to lose his good job if he, he could risk his good job. He still was tenderhearted and worried about the saints. Yeah, he didn't worry about a, a small loan of a million dollars. I just had to say that. But he still remained in touch with the people. And he began to question his brother, what is going on? See, you know, I used to get mad, uh, brothers and Marcus, sometimes when people ask me the same question over and over again. But you know what I realized? Sometimes the people that ask questions, the most questions are more interested in your vision than the folk that don't ask. Sometimes the people that don't ask questions, they may be with you, but some of them don't ask questions because they don't care. Nehemiah cared. He began to probe them and ask them what is going on. And the more he heard, the more his heart was broken. Me and I need you to know that sometimes God allows you to be under attack because sometimes we are too stern. Sometimes we are not emotional. We are not broken enough. God will break you so you can have a tender heart for the people. And you ain't got to go look for no enemies. They're going to come. Because yeah, God said, I prepare the table before you in the presence of your enemies. Your enemies going to be at the same table you at, and it's to keep you humble and on your knees. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your rod and your staff shall cover me. Why? Because they all around you. Some of your friends really your enemies. But if you pray a little harder, you will find out. <sighs> this is what I'm saying. <sighs> Nehemiah was tenderhearted, and he prayed. Now look at him. Nehemiah was in the palace fortress of Susa. See, the capital of the great Persian Empire was Susa, and they would go there in the winter months and stay there because it was warm in the wintertime. And then they would go to uh, Eskabat, Ekbatana in the, in the summertime and stay there. You know, the king went broke, so Nehemiah is reaping all these benefits. And Nehemiah has given us, have you ever had a job so good you didn't want to speak up about something? Come on, somebody. Have you ever got paid so good that you didn't want to speak up on something? Have somebody ever started trying to figure out what you get paid, what you doing this, because they want you to shut up? But let me tell you something. I don't care no matter what risk I have in my life ain't no risk greater than not doing what God tells you to do. You can't worry about your salary. You can't worry about if somebody gonna try to take you or pull you down. You gotta do whatever 
God is telling you to do. God didn't give you that blessing so you can hoard it all to yourself. God bless you so you can bless somebody else. God bless you so you can be uh, 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 you a steward so you can bless other people. That's why God bless you. That's why Jesus wants to make you a blessing, not for yourself, but so you can give the overflow to other folk. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Anyway, the cupbearer was Nehemiah. I'm just giving you some history. The present event took place in the month of Kislev, which is between November and December, the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes I. Artaxerxes ruled from 446 B.C. to 423 B.C., which means this happened around 445 B.C. While serving in the pla pa 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 uh, palace, he, was, he, he began to ask all these questions. And he found out that they were oppressing each other. He found out that they were being oppressed. He found out that they weren't doing good. And when he heard this discouraging news, it gripped his inner soul. He began to weep and mourn. He was utterly broken. I don't know if you've ever been broken by the people you lead. I don't know if you've ever been broken for the people you pray for. You got oh, to get to the point. Let me, let me just take this. See, Paul said, I don't glory in my greatness. I don't glory in my blessings. He said, I glory in my infirmities and in my reproaches because when I'm made weak, then I'm strong because then I depend on God because I know God is the, is the author and finisher of my faith. And he said he sent a, 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 a thorn to buffet me. How many people know you can't be buffeted unless something is rougher than you? You can't sand a car down unless you have something that is more rougher than the surface it is. So God will put you between some sandpaper folk at your job. Uh-huh. He'll put you between some sandpaper people at your church. He'll put you between some sandpaper people in your career. Come on, somebody. He'll put you between some sandpaper people in your relationships. Why? Because he want to buffet you. He want to make sure you humble and broken like Nehemiah was. Nehemiah was a great man of God, but he served a pagan king, yet God continued to sustain him and still began to elevate him even in the midst of, 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 of a paganism. Oh, let, me, let me look at this. How many people know that sometimes your job is so evil, but you know you got to serve God? And you got to find that balance on how do I serve God and keep my true self, yet still keep my job. Oh, y'all don't hear. That's another sermon. He, 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 he began to hear this crazy news that he, 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 he began to understand that they were starving them. And Nehemiah came and he prayed. You know, it's 12 prayers in the book of Nehemiah. Nine of them were prayed by Nehemiah himself. Nehemiah was a praying man. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Nehemiah prayed before he called his mama. Nehemiah prayed before he called his pastor. Nehemiah prayed before he called his deacon. Nehemiah prayed before he called a church conference. Nehemiah prayed before he called a board meeting. Nehemiah prayed before he met with his sisters and brothers. Nehemiah prayed and then he was allowing God to lead him. He prayed nine times in this short book. Nine times he made sure he stayed in the face of God. Are you staying in the face of God? Do you really know what God is telling you to do? I know you prayed over your biscuit. I know you prayed over your ch pork chop. I know you prayed over your steak. But did you pray before you married that man or that woman? Don't, it's too late now, so don't change your mind. Too late. Pray that God makes it better. Don't you look at him right now. Don't you look at her. Just look at me. Don't you let pastor get you in trouble now. Did you pray before you took that job? Did you pray before you bought that house? Did you pray before you went in that career? Or did you just pray over your biscuit? That's why church folk eat so much. This is the most time we pray. Nehemiah prayed before he made decisions. So even when he was faced with an all of a sudden decision, he was so prayed up, God had already put in him what he needed to say. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Nehemiah prayed nine times. First, Nehemiah began his prayer off saying how great and marvelous God was. Come on, somebody. How great and marvelous God was. How great are you? See, I believe, ne see, you cannot read the, the New Testament alone. See, some people think all you need to read is the New Testament and not the Old Testament. But if you didn't need the Old and the New, God would have never published them both. So you need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. In fact, Jesus continued to quote the prophets and so did Paul. 
So Nehemiah, if you look at it, he's a pre, he's, to me, he's showing us how we're supposed to pray. He said, oh, great and mighty God, how great you are. See, how do we solve our prayer? Oh, God, our Father, hallowed be thy name. You're telling God he's great. So let me tell you something about the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer can be prayed. But the Lord's Prayer is not really a prayer for you to pray all the time. It's a template of how you pray. See, first you have to enter into God's gates with thanksgiving. You got to tell God how great he is. Don't you want people to tell you how great you are? You know some people mad at me because I forgot to acknowledge what they did and I'm sorry. Everybody, I forgot to thank I thank you now. Please forgive me. But God... We like God. We are made in God's image, right? And God said he's a jealous God, and he don't want nobody to steal his glory. Well, sometimes we want glory too. Come on, somebody. God wants you to come and tell him how good he is. Tell him how good he smells. Tell him how great he's been doing. Whether he heal you or not, you're still with him. Whether he promotes you or not, you still love him. He wants to know that you love him and you worship him in spirit and in truth. And so you come to God and say, great are you, God. Hallowed be thy name. How great and awesome you are. That's what Nehemiah said. He didn't come to God begging. He came to God with thanksgiving, thanking God for what he did, and also thanking God for who he was. And he said, God, even if you don't deliver me, i still be with you. You got to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, my God will deliver us, but even if he don't, oh, y'all don't hear me. You got to tell God, even if you don't deliver me, even if you don't get me out of this one, even if you don't heal my body, even if I don't get the job, even if I don't get out of this hot situation, I still going to worship you. You know why, God? Because you've already done more for me than I ever deserved. Before the foundation of the world, you had already given me Jesus Christ. You had already blessed me. You already made me redeemer. Before I was in my mother's womb, you already knew me. You already called me to be a prophet. You already called me to be a teacher. You already set me apart, sanctified me, and set me aside to be used for your power. I glorify you, God. In Nehemiah, after he called him awesome, he said, Nehemiah identified with the people confessing their sin and his sins. What did we say? Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. See, God said, if you don't forgive those who trespass against you, I ain't going to forgive you. So you got to confess your sins because you messed up somebody too and confess their sins. And don't worry about it. You have to forgive them so God can forgive you. Do you know that you've sinned against God more than all the people in the world that sinned against you collectively? You understand that? No matter how much somebody did you wrong, you done done God more wrong. No matter how angry you are, and this is what's wrong with church folk too. They'll come here mad, mean mugging for whatever reason, who they mad at, me or whoever in the church they mad at, and be walking in unforgiveness, then take communion and still mad drinking damnation against yourself because you're walking in unforgiveness like you ain't got nothing that stink. Come on, somebody. Like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Like you ain't never messed up. And wonder why your blessing stopped up. And wonder why you keep losing stuff. And wonder why you're not blessed like you should. You jealous of the person beside you because you keep kicking against their blessing. If you just pray and know that God, what God has for you is for you. Don't you knock your brother or sister because you just as dirty or even dirtier than they are. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know how much they matured. You don't know where they came from. You don't know how dirty. You know what? You ain't nothing but a bag of dirt just like me. We all come from dust of the ground. Therefore, we'll never be perfect because we ain't nothing but a bag of dirt. Sinful nature can never walk in perfection. That's why Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You just got to stay prayed up. Nehemiah talked about his sins, and they sinned. Third, he pleaded for God's mercy and help. He asked God to remember his holy word. And how do we say, Lord, thou will be done on earth as it is, what? In heaven. Because it's already done in heaven. Whatever God has called you to do is already done in the spiritual realm. You just got to bring it down here to manifest in the natural realm. Faith! Is what pulls it down. See, you have been provided all of your needs. All of your needs have been supplied, what? From heavenly places. It's already been supplied for you in heavenly places. You got to step your level up in order to get it. God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory. 
Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He talking about the third heaven. And see, there's a difference. Because see, when it says you bind whatever, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. He's not talking about the third heaven. You can't bind nor loose God. He's talking about the principalities of the air from high places. That's why your weapons are not carnal, but are spiritual for the casting down of strongholds and vain imagination and anything that exalted itself against the armies of the living God. You have a spiritual gift and power. Your arsenal is not natural because your enemy is not natural. Stop cussing out your brother and sister. You got to be like Jesus. Say, get ye behind me, Satan. It ain't Peter. It ain't your church member. It ain't your deacon. It ain't your principal. It ain't your dog, it ain't your cat, it ain't your rat, it ain't your cousin, it ain't your mama. It's the devil, the adversary, that's planting those seeds of dissension and strife. It's the devil that puts you under suspicion. It's the devil that has come to kill, steal, and destroy. See, this is what you got to understand. The devil can only kill, steal, and destroy. He can't create nothing. The same demons he had that was cast down out of heaven are the same amount of demons he got now. That's why Paul said, I go from glory to glory. Do you know what your reward is? When you pass one trial, you know what your reward is? Another trial. Another level that God has taken you to. But the good thing about it, he said, if you do, if you, if you don't love your mother and father more than me, leave your house, your job, your city, your car, whatever you leave for the sake of me, you're going to receive persecution, but I'm going to give you a hundredfold blessing in this lifetime. Come on, somebody. He's going to bless you double for your trouble. He said, not my will, but your will be done. He said, God, remember your promises. And see, you know what we have? We know who we have that he didn't even have at the time. We have Jesus. Did he not say that Jesus came to give us life and to give it to more, us more abundantly? Did he not say that we were bought with a price and Jesus died on the cross to redeem us for our sin and got up on the third day and gave us the comforter in the form of the Holy Ghost and advocate a helper to lead us into all truth? We have Jesus who we call on. So even when we fall, all we got to do is say, I know I'm justified by faith. I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. Even even though I'm sinful, I'm called righteous because of my relationship with Jesus. So even though I fall in sin, God still redeems me and blesses me. Lastly, Nehemiah made a very practical request. He said, Lord, when I meet with this man, give me favor. Tell me what I need to say. Tell me what I need to do. Help me out, please, Lord. Tell me what I need to do. And what is this? Give us this day our what? Daily bread. And the bread... We call the scripture bread. Give us a say. So you saying, God, give me my word for today. Show me what I'm supposed to do today. Am I supposed to go down 64 or should I go straight down uh, 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 Jefferson Avenue? Come on, somebody. Should, should, should I go to Hampton University or should I go to Norfolk? What, what should I do? Look, 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 am I supposed to go to my job today? Am I supposed to, what am I supposed to do today? Give me this day my daily bread. Show me what I'm supposed to do. Order my steps. In your word. The problem is we don't pray enough to God and we order our own steps. We pray for pork chops and biscuits and hog maul and chitlins, but we don't pray for God to show us what we need to do and where we need to go, who we need to witness to. Let God order your steps. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, show me how I'm supposed to work out this situation. Show me how I'm supposed to run this board meeting. Show me how I'm supposed to run this church. Show me how I'm supposed to run my school. Show me how I'm supposed to run my business. God, I need you to order my steps in your word. That's what you got to do. You got to go to God and say, hallowed be thy name. You got to put him and tell him how good he is. You, you got you to go by the template of the Lord's prayer. And Nehemiah is already showing us. He's showing us that he's what? An intercessor. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He's showing us that he's an intercessor. See, 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 he is a prayed up man. But now he's not only praying for himself, he's praying for the people of Israel. So he's in between the devil and the people and in between the God and people. He's standing in the gap to bridge the relationship between the Israelites and God. But aren't you glad that you don't have to worry if Nehemiah remembers your name? 
Because you have a high priest that understands that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Do you understand that he was tempted at all points so he could relate to you? That's why I'm thoroughly convinced that no height, no depth, no principality, no pastor, no deacon, no school principal, no CEO, nobody can separate me from the love of my God. Why? Because he went to Calvary for me. He died for me. He was broke open for me. They stretched him wide. And if he wouldn't, even if I make my bed in hell, he's there with me. Look at this. Jesus is an advocate for us. He stands in the gap for us. He intercedes for us. He sits at the right hand, continuing to pray for us. He sits us to comfort in the form of the Holy Ghost to make sure that he lifts us up and continues to bless us. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Do you know that Jesus is always praying for you? He's constantly advocating for you. He sent the Holy Ghost to lead you into all truth, but you have to increase your prayer life. What? The Word of God is the Spirit sword. Remember, the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. Until you begin to read your Bible more and study the text more, the Holy Spirit won't be magnified in you enough to handle all of your trials. But if you begin to fellowship with God, if you begin to supplicate with God, if you begin to fast with God, if you begin to pray in fellowship with God, he he will magnify the Holy Spirit in you and lead you into all truth. Oh, I'm going to have to keep the ad down next time. My voice is like, sit down. Some of y'all probably like, sit down. I don't care. I'm a preacher. I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> Look here. Luke 22, 32 says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Then thou art and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This is Jesus saying, I want you to fail not. But after you get strong, I need you to help lift somebody up. Don't knock them when they fall. Pick them back up again. When one person hurt, you should be hurting. When one person fails, you should feel like you're failing because you should be pulling them back up out the trenches. Oh, but we got to get over our selfishness. Look at, look at this, though. Look at Luke 23, 34. It says, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Look at it. They took Jesus' clothes in front of his mama. They disrespected Jesus. In the midst of it, Jesus still prayed for them. See, I used to tell God, kill my enemies. I used to say it so quick. But now I'm like, Lord, they know not what they do. They don't understand what they do. They don't understand what you're telling me to do. Don't you worry about it. God, whatever you feel like doing, you just do it. If you want to kill them, I ain't going to complain about it. You go ahead and do it. But what I am saying, I need you to change their heart. You got to get to the point and say, you, 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 you got to get to the point where you don't get so mad at your enemy because one day you was an enemy to somebody. And one day you was an enemy even to God but with your sinful self and our messed up self. You got to get to the point where you say, even though they slay me. Oh, will I trust him? You know what? You really don't know how much you trust God until you go through hell, so I clap for my enemies. See, it's not until you go through some depression. It's not until you go through some hate. It's not until you go through some lies. It's not until you go through some gossip and some scandal that you really know how flat-footed you will stand for God. See, if it was not for your enemies, you wouldn't know how strong you were. They ain't nothing but a workout. They the weights that you lift in the gym. All you got to do is lift that hater up with prayer. Lift that hate off you with prayer. I ain't going to cuss you. I want to pray for you. Oh, you don't want to speak to me? I don't care. Oh, Lord, get him off me. <laughs> Nehemiah was a man who believed in prayer, who prayed often and much. This is clearly seen in the present scripture. The prayer Life stands as a strong example for us. We should pray and pray often. Look at Matthew 7, 7 and 8. It says that he, ask and it shall be given unto you. Uh, seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh Find it, and him that knocketh it shall be over. You know the problem with us is sometimes we go to the door and don't say nothing at all. Sometimes we go to the door and knock one time. Again, can I talk to my trick-or-treaters one time? When you knock on the door one time and the light on, 
You're going to knock again because you want your candy. Come on, somebody. I know I'm bringing, I know I ain't supposed to be talking about that, but I just need to give an example because it just passed by. But what I'm saying is you can knock on the door for some candy. You ought to knock on the door for the promises God has ordained for you. If you can knock on the door for a satanic holiday, come on, somebody. You ought to be able to knock on the door and say, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But you know why you don't knock on the door? Because our prayer life is not like it should be. You got to pray and pray without ceasing. You got to have God's praises continually on your lips. You got to understand that when the praises go up, the blessings come back down. You got to get to the point where you know that God said that if you praise me, I will give you a garment of praise for your heaviness. If you just praise me, if you knock on the door and seek me, I'll give it to you. But where your prayer life at, baby, y'all better be careful of when you mess with some church folk. I'm here to talk to some heathens right now. Somebody on your job you messing with is in the face of Jehovah. You don't want to mess with nobody that got a prayer life. Come on somebody because God said the battle is not mine. It's his. He said don't my enemies come at me like a flood. He will save me and redeem me. Even if my parents forsake me, he will stand with me. But I gotta be prayed up. My prayer life Life, uh, redeems me. My prayer life uh, will keep me saved uh, in the midst of dire circumstances. You know why? Because I trust my Jesus. Hey, yeah, do I walk uh, through the valley uh, of the shadow of death? Uh, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because his rod uh, and his staff, uh, they comfort me. Uh, I don't care if I make my bed in hell. Uh, He's there with me. I'm going to pray about it. When I do right, I'm going to pray about it. When I do wrong, I'm going to pray about it. When I succeed, I'm going to pray about it. When I fail, I'm going to always pray to God. Why? Because if I stay in his face, he'll hide me in his secret place. If I turn to him, and turn away from my wicked ways. He renew my strength and cause me to mount up like an eagle. Even though I fall, my Jesus has already redeemed me before he laid down the world. See, see, this is what y'all gotta understand. God does not deal with linear time and space. See, he deals with circular time and space. He, see, God is interstellar. You see what I'm saying? God sees your past, present, and future at the same time. Remember he told Moses how great he was going to bless Aaron? And then when Moses went down, right after he had got through talking to God, Aaron had everybody down there butt naked, praying over an idol. I just put it in the fire, and this is how it came out. You know how that, what had happened was, you know how... But God called him blessed in advance. God has already called you blessed. He's already redeemed you. The problem is you ain't prayed enough to unwrap the paper. See, it's just like a Christmas present. You got to unwrap it. It's not the ones old school people wrap it. You got to, it's so hard to get into it. Your blessing, God said, there still remains a rest for the people of God, but you got to struggle to get into it. The devil don't care if you try to be a principal and you're supposed to be a pastor. You elevate quick because he wants you to stay there. The devil don't care about you trying to be a CEO of a company if he wants you to teach. He ain't going to attack you in no areas but where you're supposed to be. Because he'd rather you be out of your promised seat. That's why you have to be prayed up like Nehemiah. And you have to understand, what is God telling me to do? Where is God telling me to serve? I know we come to church, but do we really pray? If we really pray, would we come in here this mad and hateful on Sunday? Would we? Would we walk in this much hatred? And just look at folk and don't say nothing. If we really were prayed up. The problem is, we think we prayed up, but it's really our will. 
See, see, that's why I tell God what I want in my prayer. And I say, you know what, Lord, but not my will, your will be done. And a lot of times he made me pray a whole different prayer. <laughs> Nehemiah was a praying man. And God ordered his steps. And he did a great thing for Jerusalem. We're going to get into this later, but he built that wall in 52 days. And it took them years, and they ain't even finished half the wall before he got there. Why? Because he was a praying man. Are you a praying man? Are you a praying woman? Are you praying for God to lead you where you're supposed to be? Or are you trying to go where you want to go? I need us to increase our prayer life. God needs us to increase our prayer life to continue to build a relationship with him so that he can order our steps in his word. I know God has all power, but he's a gentleman. He doesn't force you to do anything you don't want to do. He gives you free will. If you follow him, he loves it. But if you don't, he's not going to try to make you do it. He'll send you signs, but he won't make you do a thing. Will you pray to God and ask God to show you if the pastor has the right vision or not? Will you pray to your God and see, is your heart right or not? See, a lot of times we try to change stuff with our attitude. We try to change stuff with our power. Now, if Nehemiah would have went there trying to change it with his attitude, we got his head cut off. We got to leave our attitudes on the floor and come to God with thanksgiving and praise. And when you come to God with thanksgiving and praise, he'll get your heart right and he'll tell you what you need to ask for. The problem is we got to submit enough to God to allow him to do that. And sometimes we look at Jesus as our Savior, but do we really accept him as our Lord? Do we let him order our steps like we should, or do we try to force him into what we want? And when you begin to try to force people into what you want and force God's will, that ain't nothing but witchcraft. That's all it is. To instill your will on somebody else. You've got to go to your prayer closet. And if you're right, God will change that individual. But if you're wrong, he'll change you. But we need to learn how to pray. We need to learn how to walk in unity. And the only way we can walk in unity is we increase our prayer life. Pray like Nehemiah. Nehemiah's prayer set not only him free, it set his whole nation free. I'm here to tell you, the only way you can build the walls up of your life is to pray. The only way to keep enemies out of your life area, out of your house, out of your family, out of your emotions, is to continue to pray and fortify the walls of your life. The only way you can fortify the walls of your life is to continue to pray and let God order your steps in his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.